Hi there, and welcome to the Love or Leave the Law podcast with your hosts, Adam Olette and Casey Berman. Next, a flexible work schedule that lets you take care of what you need to do to fulfill your personal responsibilities. Big one right. for most people, you know, Casey and, and his wife uh, homeschool their kids. That's their responsibility is, is to make sure that their children are taken care of and that they have a good education. And it's, it mostly falls on his wife. But, uh, you know, he's a smart guy and he helps out as much as he can. But, you know, one of the things he wanted in his life was he wanted a flexible work schedule so that he could, you know, he could do what he needed to do and, and take time. And so tell us a little bit more about number three here. Sure. And I think, again, priorities. If flexibility is your highest priority and that's what's driving your job search, that means you may be making a bigger trade-off on some of your other criteria. But, you know, whether it's working on a contract basis, and there are different ways, you know, an axiom is one way, you guys probably know of them, yeah. where it's when people say on a contract basis, most people think of doc review, right? And that's not what it has to be. So right. whether it's through something like axiom or there's one here, Potomac Law Partners or your virtual law partners, there are many yeah. other ways to do it. And virtual offices mean you don't have overhead. So yeah. it, I think, again, kind of cast a broad net in thinking about how you might be able to structure this and propose it. I mean, no, one, no boss wants to hear your problem. They want to hear a potential solution Absolutely. and right. how yeah. you're going to add value. And sometimes before you're ready to walk out the door is the best time to negotiate because what, you know, what do you have to lose if you're going to leave anyway? Yeah. And so do you have to physically be present to do your work? Now, on the same side, I think you have to be flexible as well as your workplace being flexible. If what you say is, look, Wednesdays, I just, that has to be my day at home. You know, I've got mommy and me at 10. First of all, don't go there, right? It's not any of their business. You <laughs> right. don't, don't tell them tell what them. it is you're doing. It. Right? So, um, you, but if Wednesday at three is the only time anybody can do a call, you're going to be flexible and make that happen. Right. So I think you have to be prepared on your side as well. But whether it's consulting, contracting, part-time, I mean, some people think of part-time as, okay, my kids go to school, so I want to work like between 8.30 and 2.30, and then I don't want to have to get back on the computer. That's a tall order, right? Like yeah, maybe teaching or working in some sort of school environment. But in a situation like that, if you can get back online once you've gotten your, if this is what's driving your need for flexibility, once you've gotten things settled and then turn back to work, let's say from 4.30 to 6.30, or if you have to later that right. night, then do it that way. Other yeah. people, it's cyclical, right? So it's, at a firm, it's very hard to negotiate part-time, as we all know, and part-time is considered at least 40 hours a week, oh. but it's not going to be nine to five, five yeah. days a week. It's gonna be, you know, it comes in waves. And so yeah. I saw someone speak once on a panel who had negotiated a certain percent, 80% time, but then Enron came and she laughed. And I'm thinking, and then what did you do, right? And so at that point in time, yeah. she did it. She converted to go back, she made a lot of money, and then she was able to take some time off and think about doing something else outside of law. Right. But you, I, you with the be flex flexible. And with the flexibility, you know what I've informed people to uh, advise people on how on how that should be informed is mm -hmm. look inward at yourself. You know, are you a morning person? Are you a, a nighttime person? You know, when you when you want to talk about flexibility, the the trap I've seen people say, yeah, I love flexibility. I want to do it. But then when it comes to actually practicing it, they're not sure how to really drive their flexibility. Because some people say, well, I just want to end at 2.30. And they really don't. They they get their best work done after an af after a lunch coffee and, you know, afternoons are mm -hmm. their best times or they're morning people and they really know. I know someone who 5 a.m. to 11 is just is just where she works and that's her best time and come right. after one, her kids and also her body, she's just tired and she just, so it, I think there's also an element of looking inward at just during a day, during a week, what, when do you just work best? Listen to yourself, listen to your right. heart, listen to your it's body -awareness, and that'll help. Right. The self-awareness. Yeah. 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 And I think, right. Times of day. I mean, if you can get up at four 30 in the morning 
and you know your responsibilities don't really get going until 7 30 yeah. that's a good chunk of time right you can get a lot done but other people will say yes we have a flexible work schedule <laughs> and so someone will say great i'd like to come in from 7 30 to 3 30 rather than 9 to 5. and it's like well no one's here at 7 30 you can't do that it's like that's well right. what's the flexible part about that so you re- it's something it is very hard to negotiate, but it can be done so That's long right. as there's some revisiting and open communication about the terms. That's right. Yeah, I always thought if you really are open with management and tell them why you want that schedule and, and the benefits to them for that, and I understand the reason to, that they need to be in their seat for you know business hours because that's when business is done. That's when the clients are calling. But for me, I always worked best when the phone wasn't ringing and and now with text messaging and email and everything else, when you have quiet time, I always called it do not disturb time where my, my employees knew I, and they even bought me a little thing that put on the door DND when they knew when that was up that I was getting so much done. And, And for me, the, that couple hours a day, I was probably getting four or five hours worth of work done because I wasn't interrupted so much. And so I think if you can, uh, pitch your case to your boss or your employer or management, whatever, whatever they are to you, uh, and let them know, here's why I like to do this, not just because I'm a morning person, but because I can get so much more done and it's a benefit to them. And when you show them the benefits, then they can sometimes, in some instances, say yes to you when, when they're so rigid. Because I remember the partner that I had years ago, I was telling him, you know, I'm going to start working from home some. And he said, you can't do that. I said, why not? And I, I said, first, I'm your 50-50 partner, so you can't tell me what I can and can't do. But the fact is, let me show you what I've got planned. And then a couple months later, he started working from home. We yeah. gave away our offices at the office, and right. it, it worked really well. But uh, ultimately, yeah. you know, management, management, this is the next topic. Management that understands your need for professional development. That goes hand in hand with what we're talking about with what right. we just talked about, and that is how do you have them understand what do you want to do with your life? What do you want to do with your career? And, and the, the, the time constraints that might be there in terms of, I want to develop as a person and, and as a, an attorney or whatever you're doing, uh, how do you help guide management into understanding that ultimate path? Sure. And I think in the same way, if flexibility, you know, argue the case for yourself, mm. show them why it's in their interest to let you do what you want to do and be willing to experiment. You know, let's yeah. try this for... X number of months. Right. So with professional development, you know, we've identified a need that really either yourself or if you're managing other people, our group could use, let's say, someone to come in and do Excel, you know, just quick and dirty tips. And I've gotten good references about these people. They do a good job or whatever it is. But if you're asking them to invest in you, you have to show them the return on That's investment. Right. And yeah, right. That can be hard to do because it's not necessarily going to be, we'll produce X more widgets in the following month, right? But there is a way to do it. If you can put yourself in a situation where you're representing a client, right? A lot of lawyers are much better in that situation than representing their own interests, right? So what argument would you make for this? And what is the need? And what is the payoff going to be? And what's the cost to them? And I, you know, again, this whole idea of, all right, so you've already invested a lot in me. I'm a current employee. I know what I'm doing and I'm producing good work for you guys. It's going to cost you money to go replace me. Right. You know, but you don't want to go there first, right? No, Let's no, no. start with I'm out of here unless you da da da. And right. it's really going to. The ultimatum. Up. Yeah. yeah that, it doesn't not. work that well sometimes. And it, yeah. it may come to that, hopefully not. And then you decide, right? If you're ready to walk out the door. But in general, I think with professional development, it's, I I had done some research even in a policy position I had on looking at professional development across fields. And, you know, lawyers now, at least to me, the CLE requirements, all you have to do is have it playing. You don't even have to show that you're paying attention, right? So what is the value add there? What are you better able to do? And so think about, is this really just some conference I want to go to because it would be fun? Or am I really going to learn something here? And if so, I need to make the case for it. You know, this goes to your point six also, which is about uh, mentors who can be a resource uh, for attorneys. And I think when I look at uh, 
many people leave the law and what some of the main reasons are why I don't like my firm or I'm not connected with the client or so on. But there is a fear and anxiety in many attorneys and particularly ones younger, maybe five years, seven years, is they feel like a fraud. They feel mm-hmm. like they don't right. know the law. Mm-hmm. Yeah, someone is going to the client or a partner is going to hire a blimp and say, so-and-so doesn't know the law and doesn't know this precedent. <laughs> I mean, really afraid of being called right. out yeah. that they don't know it. And so, you know, that, that profession- I shouldn't that does happen. I mean, there's no blimp involved, but some, yeah, right, right. some people yeah. do that, right? But yeah, and so that's a big fear. And so in, in, in four about professional development, or I was just looking at your list there about mentors, but how, this was really my question for six round mentors, but how do, it, how do we ask for help? You know, we attorneys, even younger attorneys, we're supposed to be the experts. And even if we're the young attorney in a law firm through law school or college or even high school, we were, you know, we were a know-it-all or we knew a lot or so on. How, and I see this in how to leave the law behind. Many of us just keep our mouth shut. We keep going with the flow. We're unhappy, but we don't know or want to ask for help. Right. And I think not phrasing it as help is uh, an easier way to frame it. So it's information to some extent. I mean, how on earth are you supposed to know what you want to do? You've only done this. Or right. how is it that you're supposed to know how to run a deal if this is the first time or second time you've ever done it? And yeah. so you need to pick and choose carefully. But a lot of people like to talk about what they do. A, yeah. They like to be asked for their thoughts and perspective, which is what I would use rather than help or advice. Yeah, right, because right. that can make people either think less of you, ridiculously, or that, oh, well, I don't want to give advice because then, you know, are they going to come back and sue me if it doesn't come? You know, that whole mindset right. of, I don't want to be on the hook for this. But, right. you know, have a conversation, you know, and think hard about what your questions are and how do you articulate them in a way that shows you're being thoughtful about it. It's yeah. just, it's not just like, I don't know how to do this. Can you help me? Right. It's, you know, I've done this and I've done this and I'm trying to figure out exactly how this law or whatever regulation impacts this. And I just wondered kind of how you've seen this play out in other instances. Yeah, yeah I like so that. much better than, yeah. you know, I don't, you know, no, I don't know. Can you help me with this? Right. I just want to be specific. You want to preface it with context yeah. and show that it's not just you're making this up or you gave up at the first time it seemed hard. Um, but <clears throat> See it as information gathering, I think. Mm. And then in terms of mentor, I, I would use that word carefully. I don't, it's, you know, you don't want to be like, will you be my mentor? Right, or, right. You know, talk about all your mentors when they, those people would not identify themselves mm. that way. Um, so there's a lot of stuff out there, you know, mentor versus sponsor versus whatever. At this point, I would use a broad definition and just say someone who's willing to give you their perspective on what they've seen and has more experience in the area that you want to work in. So all the information you need on mentors, go to the Seinfeld episode that uh, Jerry mentors. And uh, yeah, there's a, there's a funny Seinfeld episode on that. Uh, Just that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, that has been the mentor is, is overused, but I like that because so many people, we attorneys, the, the H word, the help word is so loaded, but, but um, I'm just continuing to learn more perspective. I think it, it helps the person you're asking, uh, like you said, but I think also it's more comfortable for, for our ego that we're not asking for help. We're asking for another perspective. So it's good. I like well, that. the bar associations are setting up mentorship programs. They are. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm so excited to see this where that's what it's called a mem- mentorship program. And I've, I'm on the list and I've been helping some younger attorneys with some questions and stuff like that. Why not? And I, anybody that's been practicing for an appreciable amount of time needs to do that or even talk to their local bar association. Florida bar has one, but also where, where I have a license, but also the county that I practiced in has created one about two or three years ago. And, and it's actually been pretty successful. And we need a lot more of this because uh, as I've seen, there's so many young attorneys out there from the 10,000 that are graduating. Well, I think more than that every year, thousands, tens of thousands that are graduating and they really can't find jobs and they don't know what they want to do. And then they hang a shingle and they just don't have a clue on what to yeah. do. And this is a great opportunity to become a mentor. And if you're a young attorney, you may want to seek that out and, and use the language that Kate's talking about, not so much mentorship, That's but, uh, you know, help. It's, it, it's asking yeah. for help, which we all have problems with as human yeah. beings. So, Guidance and perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Guidance, yeah, I like that. 
Great. Um, okay, so a few minutes left. I think, Adam, do you want to tick off some of the other points? Yeah, we've got a couple that... more points we can go through pretty rapidly here. Um, awareness of various career paths going forward and how to pursue them. I think this is probably one of the most important one out of the eight because this is where people really don't have a lot of information and, and they're, they're blindsided when they think, well, do I want to go outside of what I'm doing or should I stay in and, or, or leave firms or whatever that is? How, how can they figure out these various career paths? And I know Casey's very good at this too, and he's added some insight in various episodes. But Kate, tell us about how you work with your clients on this question. Sure. And I think some of it is the question we talked about earlier about what are your skills that you actually enjoy using and whether or not that's something that you've done in your work environment or outside of it, either one, right? And so if you've been in charge of some bar committee and it involved a lot of events and that kind of thing, I mean, some people actually really like event planning, but then it sounds potentially too frou-frou. So is there a way to talk about the organizational skills that that involves or other things that um, you bring to the table in that context? Yeah. So if it's, public speaking, you know, a lot of people like that. A lot of people I see think, well, you know, I really liked school, so I want to be a professor. It's like, well, the academic market was tight even before the 2009 downturn. Right. And it's, you know, talk about moving somewhere where uh, you're not knowing uh -huh. anyone or it's an area you've never heard of. You have to be very flexible in that. And so then, well, maybe I really enjoyed college. It's like most of those require a PhD and, it, yeah. you know, talk about a long-term investment. So, all right, well, I don't really want to teach K through 12. So I think it's more uh, whether it's a role or content that you have some background in that you like. I think that's a helpful way to cut it in that, yeah. all right, I really like this role and um, who gets paid to do that? Mm -hmm. And that eventually is going to be a conversation. And again, I don't think there's any substitute for talking to people who do the type of work that you're thinking about. That's exactly but what But there is that. online Perfect. research you can do, too. right? And so how do you maybe play around with the search terms? I have so many people who are like, well, I've just searched for attorney in, you know, Indeed or whatever it is. And it's like you and 30 million other people who aren't liking their jobs. So maybe yeah. if you put in a different kind of keyword, see what comes up. And yeah, you're going to have to go through things that don't really apply to you, yeah. but better that than rely on an algorithm, right? Yeah, yeah. And so when you think about what it is that you do want to do, and also I think this, you have to be honest with yourself about the salary. If you really have crunched the numbers and you know that you need to make, you know, nothing less than say 85,000, put that in there. Do not spend a ton of time and effort Right. looking for a job that's not going to pay you what you need to make. Now, the caveat to that is what if you made less for a couple of years, then is there a potential for you to make more, you know, three years after that? So, mm -hmm. you know, it gets complicated. But I think initially think about, all right, who has deep enough pockets to pay me to do what I want to do in the geographic area I want to consider? That is one way to cut it. If your geographic area is very important to you, money is very important to you, and you're a little more flexible about what, the content like you'd work for a bank you'd work for an insurance company you'd work for you know a wide variety that doesn't right. and other people are like i really want to work for a tech company it's like all right well what do they pay people to do that you could argue you could do right there and so go. how do you do that so it really depends on what's driving your search but again i think there are many more online resources linkedin is the other thing is that who has the pro who has the job that you wish you had even if we're talking about starting with this concept yeah. of a dream job which i think is not necessarily so helpful but then you can pull out what about that makes it appealing to you so i have some people who a lot of guys in your demographic perhaps who will say uh, if I, I say if you wanted to you know if you could do anything what would it be and the professional athlete it's like, all right, well, that is not happening, unfortunately. So that ship may have sailed, but <laughs> what is it one. about yeah. that that appeals to you, right? Is it being part of a yeah. team? Is right. it being in the right. spotlight? Is it the strategy? Is it the camaraderie? Is it, and then what other, you know, rock star comes up a lot too. So what is it about that that you want to have? And then you can think about what kind of jobs offer you that. And then again, I would see it as layering on kind of what market and how much money do you need to make? That's a great exercise. I like that. 
Yeah. In the last couple minutes we've got here in this amazing interview, thank you so much, Kate. We appreciate you being here. But tell us who would be a, an ideal client for you so that everybody listening says, you know what, that's me. I need to contact her. Tell us a little bit more about who that ideal client is for you. Well, that's uh, generous of you. Very nice. But I think, to be honest, it's people who've got some substantial work experience under their belt. Mm. And typically, I'd say I work with people with 10 years and up, but sometimes less. And some people, you know, worked before they went to law school, and right. that certainly counts. But I think it's very hard to go through this kind of process, working one-on-one -on -one with someone like me, if you're right out of school, mm. until you've had some time to yeah. really get some experience so that you know what the working world is like. So I would say some that, and then also a willingness, and we were talking about this earlier, to think about how you might consider and then act on doing something outside your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So when I say the word yeah. networking, some people go pale and they're, I'm really not comfortable doing that. And it's like, well, let's talk about how you might get comfortable with that yeah. process, right? Because it's really the vast majority of jobs get gotten through networking, but it That's doesn't right. have to be your that guy who's like schmoozing everyone and yeah, walking into right. a group where it's hundreds of people, you know, no one, and you're trying to explain who you are and what you want to do. And it doesn't have to be that. So some willingness to explore and commit some time to it. I mean, the other thing is, and I understand this is hard, but... I have people who, yes, I want to move forward. This is important to me. And then they just get sucked in when work yeah, gets busy the and they life. aren't sure. able to carve out even the bare minimum. And yeah, that's I, you right. know, I think if you can do 20 minutes a day for a certain time period, regardless of how busy you are, that can keep the ball moving as opposed to, oh yeah, I dropped the ball for two months because mm, I was right. busy. So I think a willingness to both create a, uh, schedule that you're going to see this as a priority. I mean, who yeah. else is going to represent your interests, right? I mean, it's not right. billable work, but, um, and then also can, are you willing to do some work and be open to things that may seem as we were saying, woo woo or touchy feely yeah. and think about what value they might add, just be yeah. willing to explore. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Casey, any uh, parting words? And, and Yeah, Kate, no, I think that's great. And, and Kate, you know, thanks for laying that out because to say your practice is specialized in that, but you know, it seems like you, I know, it's not that it seems like you know what you're good at. You've, you know what is the best client for you. And, and I, I love how you feel strongly about that, about the, the type of experience they would have, about the need for people to look inward and be able to stretch their comfort zone because, you know, that is a huge value that you, you, you make clients accountable. Um, you want to have them, you're pushing them so that they push themselves. And I just think it's extremely valuable what you're providing. Um, we're on a mission, Adam and I, to, to help attorneys either, you know, reach their potential, refreshing their practice or, or finding an, uh, an alternative career. And, I, and there's so much potential left on the table with, uh, you know, our former classmates and so That's on. And thing. so yeah. um, I love hearing your take on the practice. I see alignment with what I'm doing, with what Adam's doing. And then I learned a lot. So yes. thank you so much. We want to have you back. Yes. Um, Everyone, if it sounds like you're in a spot where Kate's practice aligns with you, reach out to her, nevillecareerconsulting.com. Um, don't look for help. Look for a new perspective. However you feel comfortable doing it. Um, I've known Kate a long time. I know people that she's worked with. I've been following her blog. Um, a professional and just, uh, but also in alignment with the, the community that we're creating here across the states and, and across the globe. So Kate, thank you. Thank sure. You. Thank you. Appreciate and it. Absolutely. I agree with you. It's the potential. Why yeah. not use the potential rather than just keep quiet and doing right. what you're doing? That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. All Great. right. Thanks everybody. Until right. next time, Kate, we appreciate it. And we will talk to everybody soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Adam. <laughs>